You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is March 9, 2012, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, Multiple Drug Sensitivity Syndrome. Our presenter is Dr. Tara Federley. She's an Allergy Immunology Fellow at Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics. Well, anyway, so our first presentation will be given by Dr. Tara Federley. Dr. Federley is a first-year allergy immunology fellow, and she will be talking with us about multiple drug sensitivity. So I'm going to give you the keyboard. And would you like a mouse? Two, and here's the speaker. So take it away, Dr. Federley. All right. <coughs> So today I'm going to talk about um, multiple drug intolerance syndrome. Uh, first we'll go through a few questions. So question one, the most common clinical presentation for adverse drug reactions are respiratory, gastrointestinal, cutaneous, or neurological. Question two, multiple drug intolerance syndrome has a higher prevalence in each of these groups except women, middle-aged, obese, or atopic. And question three, in which situation is it appropriate to consider rechallenge to the offending drug in a patient with multiple drug intolerance syndrome? Hemolytic anemia with penicillin, Stephen Johnson syndrome with Bactrim, angioedema with ACE inhibitor, fixed drug reaction with NSAIDs. And we'll go over these again at the end. Um, so first of all, uh, I wanted to say that most individuals on record have um, usually one drug allergy, and oftentimes they'll just avoid that medication or class of medications. Um, they've done studies to look at medical records, and majority of the time, you know, it's, it's penicillin or um, a particular NSAID. Um, however, there are patients that have multiple drug allergies, and oftentimes it's going to be very frustrating for a physician. It really limits their therapeutic options for treatment, um, especially when they have, um, you know, more than three or four different classes of medications. So the definition of uh, multiple drug intolerance syndrome, it actually is kind of fairly new. There was um, a term multiple drug allergy syndrome, um, but the allergy kind of made you think of an IgE-mediated, and they found that many of these are not IgE-mediated reactions, so they changed it to multiple drug intolerance syndrome. So what it is is intolerance to three or more unrelated medications. So um, Oftentimes they found that the symptoms are subjective and the patients are, they have fear of taking medications because of their past reactions. And some of these um, people even think that they're allergic to all medications in general. Um, so intolerance can include IgE-mediated allergy, hypersensitivity, which can be IgG, T-cell, or other immunologic-mediated adverse reactions, and then there's just other adverse drug reactions. So hypersensitivity reactions, some of these can be non-allergic or pseudo-allergic reactions. So some examples of these would be like your anaphylactic reaction with contrast media. So they think that the hypertonicity actually augments basophils and mast cells to release histamine. There's acute bronchospasm with aspirin, urticarial rashes with aspirin, anemia with primaquin. This is with patients with G6PD. Um, you can have vasovagal syn uh, syncope with local anesthetics that oftentimes will mimic like an IG mediated um, where, you know, patients think they have hypotension. Um, urticarial reactions with opiates, flushing with vancomycin, which we all know about the red man syndrome, and then hepatitis with isoniazide. So adverse drug reactions, just a quick um, mention about adverse drug reactions, they do affect 10 to 20 percent of hospitalized patients and up to 25 percent of outpatients. Um, most of them are cutaneous reactions, and oftentimes they're macular, papular, or urticaria. Um, that's much more common than like a bolus-type reaction. Um, and then there's two, um, Middleton's actually divided these up into two types of reactions. So type A is the most common, and 85 to 90% of patients that have adverse drug reactions will be type A. And these are the reactions that will occur in just the general population if they're given a sufficient dose or duration of the drug. So examples of these are overdose, so it's like your hepatic failure with acetaminophen. Um, side effects, so nausea or headache with methylxanthines. 
Um, indirect effects, so this is like the GI bacterial alteration after antibiotics, like the C. diff infections that you'll get, and then drug interactions, where you have increased levels of drugs with erythromycin. So all of these are things that the general population could get, not necessarily an allergy, a true IgE-mediated allergy to the drug, or not, I should say, not an allergy. Um, the type B are uh, much less common, and these are restricted to really a small subset of the general population. So intolerance, um, the example I gave was tinnitus with aspirin. Um, idiosyncrasy is like your anemia with antioxidative drugs um, with G6PD. And then immunologic that we all know about, anaphylaxis to like a beta-lactam antibiotic. So, Again, this is kind of a fairly new concept of this multiple drug intolerance syndrome. So looking through textbooks, I wasn't able to find a lot of information, so I really had to go to the literature. I found really um, four good studies that were done to kind of describe multiple drug intolerance syndrome, so I'm going to review those for us today. Um, and I'm going to go by order. So this is um, the oldest study that I, or one of the older studies I could find, and then we'll finish up um, with a recent study um, that was from the, the annals. So the first one I'm going to talk about is a study that was done in Rome in 2007. Um, it's called Multiple Drug Intolerance Syndrome, Clinical Findings and Usefulness of Challenge Testing. So they found 480 patients. All of them were over 16 years of age. Um, they looked at them over a six-year period, and they found that they had multiple drug intolerance syndrome. So again, they had greater than or equal to three allergies, um, documented, reported allergy um, to more than three drug classes. And they also did negative skin testing and specific Ig testing. So like if it was a penicillin, they would actually do a pre-pen and make sure that they take those patients out of the equation. Um, so these patients, uh, their average ages were between, I think I have a graph. Um, you can see the distribution of their patients. Um, so for the most part, they're kind of in their 40s to 60s and 84% of the patients were female. Um, when you look at the medications they're allergic to, the most common um, were antibiotics, um, followed by NSAIDs. Those were basically the kind of the two big ones. All the rest were, were much less. Um, these patients, again, it was 480 patients. They had 2,380 total reactions with um, over 2,600 symptoms that were reported. And they reported this to over 221 different drugs. Um, each patient had a mean reaction, or had a mean of about five reactions each. And 30% had three reactions, 27% had four, 18% had five different drugs they reacted to. Again, these are from different classes. 12% had six, and one patient described um, allergy to 13 different drugs. Um, the most common was cutaneous reactions. Um, interestingly, they did find that 30 of the patients had chronic urticaria, so they weren't sure if they actually had urticaria that was unrelated to the medication or if it actually was the medication causing problems. Um, and only 12 reactions out of the 2,380 were what they called to be severe, where they had like Stevens-Johnson's or anaphylaxis or swelling of the glottis. So all the rest were more cutaneous or maybe a GI symptom. So what they did with this, these patients, they performed 1,882 drug challenges total. Um, in, this, in this study, whichever drug they're allergic to, they found a, a safe alternative and tested them to the alternative drug. So they didn't actually test the drug that they reacted to. Um, but they found a good alternative because many of these patients were avoiding medications because they felt like they were allergic to all of them. Um, and then they did have three groups. Ones that had mild reactions, they just re-challenged re them. Ones with a moderate reaction, they premedicated with chromalin. Ones with a severe reaction, or if they were giving an IV challenge, then they premedicated with antihistamines. Um, initially, when they did the challenge, too, they always did a placebo group. So they give them a placebo pill to see if they had reactions, and then they give them the alternative drug. They give one tenth of a dose, then two tenths, three tenths, and then four tenths. They observed them then for six hours in the clinic to see if they had any immediate reactions, and then they brought them back the next day to look for any late reactions. So the results of the study, 86.5% of the challenges were well tolerated. There are absolutely no symptoms at all. And those that were not well tolerated had mild cutaneous symptoms, cough or GI symptoms. All of them improved with either antihistamines or steroids. None needed epi, and none of the patients needed to be hospitalized. So they considered that 
you know, on average, each of these patients underwent about five drug challenges. So each of them were able to tolerate an alternative antibiotic or an alternative NSAID. So they felt like um, from the study, you know, a lot of these patients felt like they couldn't tolerate any NSAIDs, they couldn't tolerate any antibiotics, and they were able to find something in every single patient that they studied. So it would be a different class, right? I mean, like if it was, say, like penicillin, they would do like Depocorin. Yeah, in this study, they did a different okay. class. I'm so. kind of disappointed. I think they should have just challenged them with the yeah, yeah, there's more, more, yeah, there's because more the odds study. are they wouldn't have reacted and then yeah. just taken, taken that off part. rather than just saying you can't tolerate it. Yeah. yeah so Unfortunately, we have more studies that actually do that because okay, this one good. was an early study and they, they did alternative drugs. And I mean, that was one of the limitations I talked about. They didn't actually challenge to the actual drug. And also, they used pre-medication, which could have masked some of these reactions. Well, I was interested by the pre-medication with chromalin, yeah. because actually Dr. Jones had just sent an email to the faculty about, um, about if any of us had experiences in chromalin as a pre-medication for red man syndrome. For, oh. Because um, um, I never I, heard of it. It wouldn't even make sense to use it, because red so, man syndrome is a dose-dependent degranulation of mouse cells due to vancomycin. It's usually given intravenously, so how would oral or any old... Uh, so there, so there's, actually, like there's actually some evidence. Um, it used to be when I was a fellow that people recommended giving um, cymetidine as a pre-medication as a side effect or side bar here. But um, there's actually some articles um, where they did some studies where they gave IV pre-medication with H1H2 for red man mm. and prevented it in 89% of patients. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, um, so there were some limitations to the study, but... Fortunately, there's more. Okay, so the next study, um, this one's really interesting. So this was done in New Delhi in India in 2010. Um, it's called patient report, or it was actually reported in 2010. Um, patient reported multiple drug reactions, clinical profile, and results of challenge testing. So they actually looked at a retrospective review of records for five years. Um, they only found 23 patients, um, and they had greater than two or more drug allergies. So you remember in our definition, it's greater than three or more. But in this particular study, they decreased it down to two. Um, and then they, they, these patients also underwent challenge testing. Um, the patients in this study, their mean age was 36.4, plus or minus 12 years. So again, kind of in that um, middle age. Uh, females were 82% females. Um, the patients report anywhere from two to 40 drug reaction episodes. Um, and then antibiotics and analgesics were, again, the most commonly implicated drugs, and 60% reported reactions with either urticaria or angioedema only. Um, if they had a, a very severe anaphylactic reaction to a drug, then obviously they wouldn't retest them to that particular drug, but those patients still had other um, reported allergy that they tested to. So overall, these 23 patients underwent 350 different challenges they averaged 15 challenges per, per patient. So what they did was they put these patients into the hospital for about two weeks at a time, and they would challenge them to, um, if they'd had a suspicion of a true reaction, they'd give them half of a dose one day, and the next day they'd give them the full dose. And if they didn't think that it was a true reaction, they'd just give them the full dose on that day. And then the next day they'd challenge them to a new drug. And they would do in this study commonly used medications, so like NSAIDs and other things, even if they didn't say they were allergic, just because a lot of these patients felt like they were allergic to everything. And then they would also do the inciting drug that had caused initial reaction. Um, what was interesting about this study is that when the patient had a rash, they actually had a dermatologist on call that would come and look at the rash. And if they felt like it was not suggestive of a drug allergy, they would repeat the drug dose or give placebo and see if the reaction was repeated. So I thought that was kind of an interesting um, a, a interesting thing that they did with the study because, uh, you know, a lot of times if you send them home and they get a rash, no one's there to see it to know if it's really a drug rash or if it's, you know, something that's less severe. You can really tell by looking? But that's what they're saying. Well, that's kind of what Sunina was talking about with, the, with that lecture. I think we have a grand round coming up at the end of this month where they're going to talk about drug rashes and differentiating between benign rashes and true drug rashes. So anyway, the results of the study. So again, um, what did I say? In this one, they did 350 challenges, and three of them were positive, um, three of those challenges, and all of them were with NSAIDs. Um, 13 patients 
had symptoms that were actually not true reactions. So when they repeated the exact same drug, they had no reaction. Or if they gave him placebo, they had like the same reaction with a placebo. And then seven, seven had absolutely no reactions at all. So over, over, um, overall, 13.4% had symptoms they described as allergy, um, dizziness, weakness, itching, headache, nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, chest pain. But 26% of patients reported symptoms after placebo, itching, urticaria, burning of their palms, and dizziness. You can kind of see an overlap in some of those symptoms. So basically, after they did this, <laughs> um, after the study, they basically determined that none of these patients qualified for diagnosis of true multiple drug hypersensitivity. They tested them to 15 different drugs, and none of them had more than three true drugs. Uh, only three of them actually had a true reaction. Um, so they were able to rule out multiple drug hypersensitivity in these patients. They followed up only three patients and found out that they were taking medications whenever as prescribed before. They were avoiding all medications, and so were their physicians and they were having no adverse effects. Um, so what they said is they believe that true allergic, um, like multiple drug reactors are exceedingly rare, and a lot of people believe that they're allergic to multiple unrelated drugs. They're usually mistaken. So some of the limitations in this study, um, they were only testing people in the hospital that were willing to come in for two weeks. So some people that actually had true allergic reactions may have that I don't, I don't want to be tested, and that may have biased their findings a little bit. Again, it was a small study, only 23 patients. Um, they gave new drugs every day, so if there was like a late reaction, it would be harder to tell because they were giving kind of drugs back to back. And then also, it would have been interesting to see if they could have followed up on all 23 patients to see if these patients really had their fears alleviated or if some of them were still avoiding medications. Because they did say there was one patient I believe who still, even though she had um, testing, she still believed her urticaria was from um, certain medications and was continuing to avoid them. Okay, uh, next study. So this is another one out of Rome in 2012. It was published, um, Allergy and Psychological Evaluation of Patients with Multiple Drug Intolerance Syndrome. So in this study, they actually chose only women ages 30 to 60 and they performed psychodiagnostic testing on them um, if they had multiple drug intolerance syndrome. And again, they, they made sure that they did negative IgE um, testing to make sure they were ruling out like the true um, penicillin allergies and that kind of thing. Obviously, there's not testing for all of our medications, but I think in this study, they actually did skin prick testing and some patch testing to medications even. Um, and then they, if there was an IgE available, they did that as well. Um, in this study, NSAIDs were the most common and antibiotics were second. So the results of this study, um, again, they compared them to 30 healthy adults that had no drug allergies. And they also took out patients that had severe or um, major psychological diagnoses. Um, so, you know, if they had schizophrenia or something, they were not included in the study. Um, so these patients, they did, I think, five different uh, psycho diagnostic evaluations, they found that they had higher levels of anxiety, they had higher grade of depression, more somatic symptoms, higher grade of alexithymia, which they described as inability to identify emotional aspects of social interaction. I don't know exactly what that means. And I think that they coined that term because they were describing how it was this new phenomenon that they had discovered. Named after somebody's name. <laughs> Alex. Named after Alex. <laughs> Um, and they also said that they had on their scale, on their scoring, a worse quality of life than the control patients. Um, so what they felt is that patients with multiple drug intolerance syndrome really should be looked at from an allergy standpoint as well as from a psychological standpoint to evaluate for anxiety and depression, which could be contributing to some of their fears and of taking medications. That's a, that's a hard pill to swallow. For, for, for people to, to, for like an allergist to say, well, it's, you know, you, have, uh, you, know, you need to see a psychologist you need as to well. Be psych. yeah. um, a difficult this, this, that's a, that's a unique conversation that has to take place. In Truman, we say biofeedback. Uh, <laughs> but you do have like the middle aged women who are allergic to codeine and, well, yeah. and every oh, antibiotic yeah. oh, yeah. and every you narcotic. Can. Well, and practice, that's where all the, the local anesthetic reactions came from. 
Um, if you're allergic to all these drugs, that can be depressing. I mean, what, what causes <laughs> what? Chicken or the egg. Yeah. And they're anxious because they're reacting to everything. Of course yeah. they're anxious, right? I think so. Yeah, that's true. We don't know causation here. All right, so that brings us to our last most recent study that was um, published in the Annals here, just 2012. So multiple drug intolerance syndrome, prevalence, clinical characteristics, and management. So this was a really interesting study. They actually did an electronic medical record search um, using Kaiser Permanente Southern California Healthcare Plan members. 2,375,424 people were evaluated. So they said that'd be like 1% of the U.S. population. So they felt <laughs> like it was a good sample. I mean, they're all out in California, but I mean, it's, they kind of wanted to see the population-based just allergy prevalence. So again, they're looking at anything that's put into the allergy record, which could be an adverse drug reaction, hypersensitivity, or a true allergy. Um, and they wanted to look at prevalence um, as well. So for incidents, so they looked at just the year 2009, anyone who was enrolled during that year. Um, for incident rates, they actually noted new drug allergy per person in 2009. So anytime someone developed a new allergy, um, they used that to determine their incidence rates. Um, on this on this particular study, the most common allergy, oh, I think I have, yeah, this is just all allergy in general that was that was found. So penicillin was the most common, both both for males and females. And then you can see the top, you know, six or seven are all antibiotics. And then you get to narcotics and NSAIDs, and then ACE inhibitors. Um, some of these are going to be in like your older elderly patients. Um, they did find it statistically significant that females had more allergies than males. And I think I talked about this here. So what they found for prevalence was 20.1% had at least one reported allergy. And again, allergy is kind of a broad term. That's, I think, quotation. Um, and females reported higher allergy prevalence for all medication classes. And then 3% had at least one new allergy during 2009. And females, again, reported higher new allergy incidence rates. So the next thing they did, sorry, it's kind of small, was try to determine how many patients had this multiple drug intolerance syndrome. So again, they needed more than three medications from different drug classes. They divided up into severe and moderate. So the severe patients, they said, had greater than four drug classes and more than 10 different medications were included on their allergy field. And then moderate was everyone else that was less than that. Is this all age groups? Actually, it is all age groups. Um, well. So another, okay, but that being Kaiser Permanente, you know, take care of adults and kids. So. Yeah, that's a good question, because they, they talked about the average age. What's well, the range? 17.9 uh, to Oh, uh, so it's adults. They just look at adults then. Yeah, that's a good yeah, but if you look at the moderate, the age range is 1 to 105. Yeah. Oh. 106. Wow, 105 year old. Oh, yeah, because these are the severe. So, yeah, zero. So they did look at pediatrics. So that's a, a zero year old? They did. Zero. So they had a one year old that had more than three drug allergies in different classes. They had 106 year olds? Wow. <laughs> these are long lived people. That's an advertisement for the healthcare program. <laughs> <laughs> Take care of me from zero to 106. Okay. Yeah. Three different drugs. You're not going to have severe. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty sure they made it this far. Yeah, but 99, you know. So I'm, I'm going to go to the next slide just kind of summarize this information. Um, basically, out of the entire population, 2.1% of patients met the definition of multiple drug intolerance syndrome. Um, again, in this study, they found they're most likely to be female, 84.9%. They were more likely to be older, so 62 plus or minus 16 years, so kind of your middle age. And they actually looked at BMI and found out that the patients were more likely to be heavier, um, with a BMI of 29 plus or minus 7. So interestingly, they also looked at how often these patients were coming, like using healthcare services. So they had higher rates of healthcare utilization. So this included um, radiologic procedures, inpatient visits, outpatient visits, and ED visits. They had increased medication usage in general. So they had more prescriptions prescribed, including more antibiotics and more narcotics than um, patients that did not have EDIS. 
So they have more opportunities to have a reaction. Have a reaction. Yeah. yeah. And they had or yeah, or had a propensity to be wanting more. Well, the question is how many reactions per prescription? Right. And is that yeah. any higher? Right. If you give more prescriptions, you're going to have a greater chance. Exactly. Right. Yeah. So again, to look at the other groups that they put up, so health plans with any, okay, so with no. So they still had a huge majority that had none, nine or ten. Yeah, no allergies at all. Yeah. So that's for half well, because the last, study, though. the last one, they only found 20% that had one reported allergy. So yeah. 80% had, had none, had none yeah. during that year. Yeah. yeah. Had none recorded. Is that right? They had... Oh, yeah, an end of 1897. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, and then also the patients that had multiple drug intolerance syndrome were more likely to get a new allergy in, in that year. So they had a higher incidence of allergy. Um, when they kind of looked at why these patients were seen in the healthcare setting, they also found that they were, they were going in for more common non-morbid conditions like URIs or pain or fatigue. You know, there's a lot of back pain or headache or, you know, fatigue where the other patients had more propensity to be coming in for hypertension or you know, more morbid conditions, I guess. Um, next one. So in their study, they also showed that these patients had a higher association with anxiety. So they looked at the top 20 diagnoses for each patient and found that anxiety was more likely to be found in the patients with multiple drug intolerance syndrome than in the general or in the rest of the population. They did not find an association with depression, and for depression they either looked for the diagnosis of depression within the top 20 or the use of antidepressants. Um, so they didn't see that that correlated, and they didn't see any serious mental illness in these patients. Um, so again, that was a little different than the study that was done in Rome where they did find anxiety and depression were both um, higher. Um, interestingly, so even though anxiety, anxiety was linked with multiple drug intolerance syndrome, it was not associated with IgE-mediated allergies. So patients that had true, like anaphylactic drug allergies did not have increased levels of anxiety um, where it did correlate with this syndrome. And also anxiety wasn't correlated with life-threatening illnesses. Sounds like a causation because if they're have a lot of drug allergy and they, there was no correlation with anxiety. I'm going to say it's not that. <laughs> yeah, because they, those patients have true anaphylactic allergies or life-threatening Ill, other illnesses. Yeah. No, it's not the disease process itself. Mm -hmm. <coughs> um, so again, multiple drug intolerance syndrome had no association with life-threatening illnesses, no association with ig mediated allergy. Um, so even the patients that did have ig mediated allergy, there wasn't necessarily a correlation with having more allergies. And then A to P was not correlated in this study. So in this study, it was interesting, too, at the end, even though I'm not, I don't know exactly how this came from their study, but they made recommendations of what they would, how they would treat or manage multiple drug intolerance syndrome. So I thought it was kind of interesting to include that here. Um, so the first thing they said is you can avoid the drugs that they say they're allergic to. It's maybe the safest and most convenient way to manage these patients. But obviously, you're going to have patients that have life-threatening conditions where they need a particular drug, or they just have so many drug allergies that there's nothing you can give them. So they said that if you do careful history, they felt like it was safe to test or rechallenge most of these patients. So if you have urticaria or angioedema associated with NSAIDs, this excluding aspirin exacerbating respiratory diseases, they felt like it was safe to rechallenge because a lot of these symptoms are transient in nature and could be treated with like an antihistamine. Um, they felt like with aspirin exacerbated respiratory disease, that's obviously a different process. You need to challenge them to prove it and then desensitize them to aspirin. Um, the classic IgE-mediated reactions, obviously, is available. You want to perform skin testing and specific IgE testing. And if negative, rechallenge under observation, which, you know, we've, we've all done before. And this was kind of the interesting sentence that they put in there. Um, with, and this is specific to patients with multiple drug intolerance syndrome. Um, if they have macular papular rashes, fixed drug eruptions, nausea, vomiting, GI abscess, diarrhea, drug fevers, other mild symptoms or kind of unknown symptoms that they couldn't really recall that weren't severe, they felt like you should rechallenge all these patients. Um, so again, they didn't kind of go into detail about how you rechallenge them. You know, is it one where you rechallenge them in the clinic and you watch them for six hours, or if you put them in the hospital for two weeks and give them a bunch of different drugs? I mean. You know, obviously they didn't go into those details, but they did say that it's something you need to consider, especially if they need that particular medication for whatever condition they have. 
Um, they did kind of put a blanket statement out there that individuals who have toxic epidermolysis um, or TEN, Stephen Johnson, blistering, desquamation, severe hepatitis, nephritis, hemolytic anemia, or ACE inhibitor induced angioedema, you should not rechallenge that. That's kind of their blanket statement. Those are the things that you really want to um, be careful with because they could have even a more severe reaction the next time. Well, and those are really bad things. Yeah, you don't want those to recur. Uh, so finally, when they talked about kind of what to do about this syndrome, how do we address this, one of the things that they mentioned was um, antibiotic overuse probably accounts for a significant proportion of reactions. Again, like you said, Dr. Portner, if you're giving them a lot of different medications, they're bound to get some kind of reaction. Um, so trying to avoid antibiotics when possible is going to be helpful, not only for um, resistance, but also um, you know, the chance that they can have a virus and have a rash and think it's related right. to the drug. Viral. Or they even said NSAIDs can cause her to carry in rash and that coincides with infections. So they take the NSAIDs, they take the, yeah. you know, whatever penicillin and they, you know, attribute it to the medication or the um, prescription, prescription right. medication. Um, they, al they also mention, and this is more for kind of the older, middle-aged, older group, try to reduce polypharmacy because that may reduce iatrogenic multiple drug intolerance syndrome. So, you know, you see patients that are on 12 different medications. They said really try to back them down if they're not absolutely necessary because the more medications you have on, the more drug reactions, the more possibility that they could have more adverse drug reactions and not true drug allergy. Um, so when I thought about this study, in terms of uh, kind of limitations of the study, the one thing, you know, they were just analyzing a medical chart, electronic medical record, and as you know, when you get busy in clinic, you don't always put everything into the electronic medical record. So you can only study as much as what the physicians put in. So if they didn't put in every single reaction, or and they didn't know the details of what some of these reactions were. Um, and then also they didn't have any rechallenge data on any of these patients um, for the most part. It's not usually done. Um, so just kind of an overview for multiple drug intolerance syndrome. I think it's something we need to consider, especially in a patient that we see more than three different drug classes of allergies, um, especially if they happen to be middle-aged women and potentially more anxious. I don't know. Um, but, I mean, just think about that demographic of patients since, it, I mean, it's definitely consistent throughout all the studies. Um, and then also, like you said, if, if possible, to do this in a politically correct way, consider maybe psychological evaluation or if they have other reasons that they may want to be tested for anxiety or depression. Um, and then again, try to avoid or limit medications if possible. And really rechallenging is going to be important, especially, you know, a lot of these patients are avoiding all medications and it's just very frustrating for physicians. Those allergists, we need to try to dispel some of these fears. and challenge into the medications. Hopefully there'll be more studies about how to do that, you know, exactly the protocols for this. But well, my for the most own, part, you can give them and watch them. My own, my own take on this is, is then that if you have someone who comes on these history, you try to find out what you think is allergic or not allergic or whatever. <clears throat> um, a lot of these people are uh, are tied into or, or, or um, I guess, um, to the fact that they have these multiple things. It's almost like a badge of honor sometimes. Yeah. And um, so it's often difficult to talk to them about that these aren't allergic reactions. Um, you find in pediatrics that a number of people come in with reported reactions when they've never even had the drug because their parent is allergic. So right. automatically that makes them allergic, which most of these drugs don't have any, um, any genetic uh, factor that that would play into a role in, unless you're a slow acetylator of, um, of uh, um, not the truck or I mean of the actor. Um, the, uh, um, the what um, what often happens is these patients come in and they like look for kids for recurrent ear infections and they want some antibiotic or whatever. So usually I try to find out with the history is there some antibiotic that they've tolerated. If it is, they'll cover whatever the infection. I tell them to stay with that antibiotic. In some cases, if they had multiple things, we've recommended past some older antibiotics, even like things like rifampin, which um, we don't use very much, but some can cover some of these um, traditional um, infections. But it's a class of antibiotic they haven't been exposed to, but they have it. It's not the first time thing. Is it going to be an IgE thing? Um, but if there is some antibiotic that they that they've tolerated, I usually have them stay with that. That's the drug to use. I tell them to, to and I 
give this in a letter to the primary care doctor that basically if they have an infection, they need to do everything reasonably possible to document they have an bacterial infection that needs an antibiotic. So if it's just a cold, don't give an antibiotic. You know, if you have a urinary infection, you have a positive culture, give the antibiotic or whatever. But, um, but basically to avoid this overuse of antibiotics, as we see often, which is more linked to this. Now, um, Dr. Porter and I have also seen a lot of people who have, I don't know, I don't know what you call this, Jay, uh, we've talked about this before, where some of these people are like their immune system is, is turned on and it doesn't matter what drug you give them, they'll have, or they can have a reaction to it. And we'll sometimes see people like that. But the, the big thing is if you can, if you can avoid the cycle of frequent antibiotics, find something they can tolerate, and while, and while they're taking that, you know, if they can treat that infection in between time, you can do these oral challenges to whatever the drug is, especially drugs that you don't think are really allergic or if, if penicillin testing is indicated or whatever, but do all that stuff in the meantime and then prove this stuff. Now, in some of these patients, you know, you, usually if we, if we think the risk is low, we'll do an oral challenge or if we do the skin testing thing, we'll do the oral challenge. In some cases, I've had it actually, you know, um, set up like a placebo oral challenge yeah. where you may well, even do a few doses that are placebo or something basically uh, because they're so invested in, you know, being ill sort of thing. Yeah. So just like that study in India did where they did some placebos. So sometimes you have to do that. But um, it is a, a long process because for those people that you can you can say, we did this, see, nothing happened, nothing happened, nothing happened, then it's easier to, to, to buy in that, you know, my child's cured or whatever, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Yeah. Is there any data on those studies you saw that showed people that, like examples of people that legitimately had more than one true drug allergy? In the particular studies that I looked at, they didn't. You know, like but if someone comes in with 10, like, what's the likelihood that they actually have more than you know, one of those that's actually... But a couple of them excluded any patient that had, like, a allergy yeah. test that was positive, and they didn't specify how many allergies that they had, so there may have been some. But like, I always wonder, like, when someone comes in with a list and, like, maybe they had one actual reaction and then the rest of them were, like, them being hyper hyper vigilant or whatever, yeah. you know? Well, that was kind of like the study where if they had a severe reaction where they needed epi or hospice or something, they didn't test that, but they still tested the 15 other drugs in the they one where they put them on. and they passed them off. That's what it always seems to me, like, if someone comes in, there's, if anything, there's, like, one good history of one, and then the rest of them are, like, mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Or they'll just probably get it. Or I was nauseous. Yeah. They'll call together, yeah, all of them, like, it had been swelling with all of them. Oh, so yeah. Because yeah. they know yeah. that that's what they're yeah. supposed to say. Yeah. And then if you try to go yeah. through and get the history of what time and when the dose was given and first course, know. course, second yeah. course, like, they don't know any of that. Well, the and other, it's always 20 years ago. Yeah, the other thing you find in pediatrics is that it's not uncommon to see that they, that they had some reaction, be it from the drug or some viral illness, and then they got off and then they were given another antibiotic, but the reaction was still going on and they still reacted, so that was listed. And they put a third and that was listed. So it was really Everybody the virus or the first viral? thing, you know, whatever. And it, But now we have three drugs that are listed. Yeah. They're getting three different antibiotics for that ear infection. And I think PCPs, too, are more likely. We're the ones that, you know, see the beginning of this or EDs. They don't. They aren't used to taking this type of history. So, oh, you had a rash scan, and write it down. Yeah. It's done. It's listed. Time, time. And then when you actually end up seeing the patient, because we don't really see that many referrals for drug allergy itself. We see kids for other problems, and then in taking the history, we get this big list that we might go through, and it's been three years, and they don't remember, mm -hmm. and, you know, doesn't have that information. So the history is hard to take. And they didn't have any pediatric studies that I could find. Um, there was one where they had some, you know, allergies to antibiotics, but none of them really had more than three separate drug classes. It's just not very common. But more and more, it seems like it's we're seeing, becoming yeah. we're seeing it more. I had that newborn who was transferred from another hospital with the list of allergies like vancomycin, fentanyl, morphine, and he had to have procedures. Oh, yeah, so we challenged to vancomycin first because that was what they really needed at that time. And then gradually we realized he was just having urticaria, just neonatal yeah. from, you know, just random uh, times when he had viral infection or something. And then he needed procedures when he need, needed fentanyl drip and morphine. So we kind of gradually did all the checks and everything was, everything was negative. Everything was negative. Yeah. Yeah. It seems to me like yeah. its decision points are only like, you know, Stevens Johnson type stuff. It's right. like one decision yeah. point. Like severe anaphylaxis is like a second decision point, and then everything else. Everything is is <laughs> like, those are only three things I like ever in my mind want to differentiate. Like was it A, then, B, or C? And then the other thing is, one of the studies showed that some of the patients had like 
side effects like dizziness and things right. like that. The problem is, even if it was side effect, does the patient want to go back on those patients? Right. You know, even then, is it enough still a side effect where they don't But it can't really be want. explicitly listed that way, you know, right. like in terms right. of the term, because then you can say bye. Maybe tolerate a, a same drug in the same class. class. Right, right, right. Or, you know, maybe or dose dependent, you know, if they have less. Or if it's a life-threatening infection. <laughs> you know, I, I'll be dizzy for a couple weeks if it didn't take my life. But it's still nice. Yeah. 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 But it's listed that way. To me, I always thought in practice I would do a lot more drug challenges when people come in and just say, let's pen like I feel like it's, that's not what they're here for. We really just kind of put it on the back burner, at least I do. You know, like where I would actually just say, okay, you said you're allergic to penicillin, like you may need that in the future. Like do you want to just know, you know, as yeah. opposed to just putting it on the back burner. Yeah. Well, don't you do a lot of those? I mean, I don't do as many as I, we probably should. Yeah. Yeah. We I, offer it. I don't, I don't, I don't really feel like so I offer it. I, I, do. Like, I, I do in certain circumstances, but I don't think I do that like routinely. Every patient that I've had penicillin, especially when they say it was like when they were a year old and now they're 15, I'm like, we'll do it, and they just don't ever come back. They don't come back. Yeah. Right. We, we we've talked about a lot of them. They don't come. They don't come. But I just do it that visit. I don't have them come back. When they give me the history, I challenge them right then. I don't schedule it. I don't have them come back. We don't do any pre-pen or anything. You know? No. I just well, unless it's any other I just do it. 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 I just I've never had anyone react. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure these patients. So the answer is bad. You just say, wait here 10 minutes and we'll get grab some oxygen. Uh, uh -huh. Well, it's oh, a service. So, yeah, they come in and that's a history. And I say, oh, by the way, no, 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 no. would you yeah, like to Yeah, because you want to sit the waiting room and do it, right? Let you do, like, yeah, the graded. hang around for an hour and yeah. it's easy. Mm -hmm. If I really thought they'd react, I wouldn't do that. Yeah, yeah. These are all these vague history things. Yeah. We can have just a whole assortment of medications in our arsenal. And since here, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> How much time do you want? Can you take a shot of mine? <laughs> so you have some questions? Oh, there's a few questions there. Oh, yeah, most common presentation. Yeah, okay, Daniel. I guess I already knew that. Um, that was actually on one of the fitball corner questions. Oh, well, look at that from middle. Right. Um, oh, I gave it. Yeah. So high yeah. 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 premise, we've been over this a ton. Um, women millage and then in this study they said higher BMI, so ETOPI is not um, And then in which situation is appropriate to consider rechallenging based on their history and all that? Which I was kind of surprised, you know, it's like, oh, six drug reaction, that sounds bad. Yeah, you know, they said yeah, that. that. I, didn't, I didn't put that. I My ditch a little. Yeah. All of those things I for sure don't. Yeah. So the last slide is just... <laughs> Yeah. Oh, very good. You know, I didn't put the information in there. A lot of those two, I guess they did, the ones where they did pre-medication, some of them they went back and did it without pre-medication. A few of those they repeated and they still tolerated it. So I guess they, you know, maybe they were thinking maybe the same thing that they were masking something and tried it without. All right. Anyway. Very good. Very good. Thank you. This has been an ACAAI production. To learn more about conferences on line allergy or the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, go to www.acaai.org. See you next time. <laughs>